Erev Tov, and good evening, everyone. My name is Rabbi Yona Berman, and on behalf of Yeshivat Chovavei Torah Rabbinical School and our community partners and institutional partners around North America, it is an honor and a pleasure to welcome you to tonight's kickoff of our Shemitah Beit Midrash, our YCT community Shemitah Beit Midrash, the first of six sessions that we'll be meeting on Zoom along with one extra session that will be recorded and presented uh, on video along with Rabbi Avi Weiss. It's a pleasure to have you with us. This program has been months in the making and it is a real honor to be able to be with you, to see all of you with us and to know that there is a lot that we're going to learn together uh, tonight and in the nights that will follow on a monthly basis from now through March. As we kick off our series tonight, I was thinking earlier about what it was that, that brought these sessions together, looking at our amazing speakers list, thinking about the schedule that we have lined up. And the question was, what's the curriculum? What's the way that we decided these are the topics that people are going to speak about? And we haven't even told you all the topics yet. You'll be receiving an email with those topics in the near future. And the best way I can describe the way that we decided what people should speak about is we asked them. We basically said to them, tell us your TED Talk on Shemitah. What is important to you? What do you care about? What are you going to have fun and enjoy teaching so that you can enjoy learning about this and these important topics with each and every one of you? And so we have the opportunity tonight, of course, to learn with Rabbanit Leia Sarna. I'll present some more of the schedule to you later on as we continue. Uh, but in the meantime, I want to remind everyone that if you'd like to take advantage of the closed captions, uh, you can do so by pressing the CC button on your screens. And we also, of course, have American Sign Language ASL interpretation live on our screen. So along with Leia, you'll see Rivka uh, in front of you tonight. And we thank both of them for their hard work uh, as we begin this conversation. And I want to uh, actually start off uh, speaking with you, Rabbanit Leia, right now. Uh, Rabbanit Leia, of course, is the Associate Director of Education and the Director of the High School, at high school Programs at Drisha, Drisha Institute for Jewish Education. She previously served as Director of Religious Engagement at Anche Shalom, B'nai Israel Congregation in Chicago, one of our partner institutions tonight. She was ordained at Yeshivat Baharat in 2018, studied at Yale, Migdal Oz, and other important institutions along the way. Uh, Rabbanit Sarna has published in a number of different places, including The Atlantic, Washington Post, Lair House, My Jewish Learning, uh, and it is a pleasure and an honor to have her with us tonight, uh, a friend, a colleague, uh, and someone who I always learn from every time we have the opportunity to interact together. So Rabbi Leah, um, I'll ask you a question as I uh, ask you to unmute yourself, which is, Ma'inyan Shmita itzel Kutzlaaretz. What are we doing talking about Shmita, a mitzvah that has to do with the land of Israel, the background that I've set up for myself tonight, this virtual background, even as I feel far away, 6,000 miles away in my apartment in Riverdale. Rabbi Leah, what is Shmita to do with us here in Kutzlaaretz? You please talk to us about that and get us started. That would be great. Welcome. <laughs> Arif Tov, everyone. Thank you all so much for coming out. Um, and thank you to Ishmael Huri Torah and Rabbi Yoda Berman for putting this amazing series together. And I'm so excited to learn from so many of my colleagues and teachers in the months to come. It's such a, a, a privilege to be kicking this all off. Um, and I should also mention that I have a tendency to speak very kind of quickly and I've been asked to really kind of slow it down. So um, in order to, to keep up with the, the ASL and closed captioning, so uh, I'm gonna do my best and I'll be called out if, uh, if my best isn't, isn't cutting it. Um, so the plan for tonight is I'm going to give a few words of introduction now, and then we're gonna divide up into um, to some prep time and. Uh, Rabbi Berman's going to explain how that's going to work when we get there in about five minutes. Then we'll come back together and and we'll learn some more um, and we'll learn some more sources together and uh, and we'll talk about them and then we'll have some time for for Q and A at the very end. So that's just sort of the structure of where we're going. In case you're curious. So to return to um, Rabbi Berman's original question of like, what does Shemitah mean to those of us who live in Kutzlaret and given that it is very much the deep middle of the night in Israel right now. I think we're really, we're really all sitting in Chutzlaaretz right now. Um, you know, um, one of the one of the ways to try and get at that answer is to is to try and dig into some of the 
maybe like a, a, a philosophy of Shmita or like a different angle on what is Shmita all about in addition to the agrarian piece of it, but could the agrarian piece of Shmita maybe be in some way symbolic or could it um, not necessarily, meaning if you're a farmer, this is not symbolic, this is very serious, this affects your life tremendously, but, um, but maybe there's something about the experience that someone who lives in Eretz Yisrael and works in agriculture has that we sitting in Chutz Arts can find a way to tap into. So that's the project of this shoe. Or and the way I want to get at that is actually from a character who I believe thought that we should practice Shmita every year, 365 days of the year. And that character is Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, um, in the Gemara and Brahu that I'm going to send you to go spend some deep time with in a minute, um, puts forward a, a, philosophy, a controversial philosophy of um, how a, a Torah student, but really how every Jew should spend their time in the cycle of the year. And his colleagues disagree with him. Um, and But he, he uses very strong language in his own defense. And then we see later generations. So, um, we see Rava and Abaye sitting in, in Babel, um, you know, kind of evaluating, like, what do we think of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's uh, philosophy of this? How do we run our own yeshiva? Um, and so we'll see kind of that. And the Talmud really does this kind of like evaluative work of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's position. So if we read the Talmud without taking into consideration, you know, who all the speakers are and where they're sitting, um, we, we won't get to see the full richness of it. Um, so, so it is very important to know Rav and Abaye are a number of generations after and in a totally different place from Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. And then we also have a statement brought down by Rav Barbara Khanna, who's actually um, earlier than Rav and Abaye, but that the, the sound of the Gemara is kind of weaving in, in addition to their evaluative conversation. So that's just by way of introducing the Gemara and the food. And then after you spend some time with the Gemara and Brachut, you're going to see a Gemara from Masachet Shabbat. Now this, the Gemara from Masachet Shabbat may very well be familiar to you. It is our sort of core story about Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. It is Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and his son in the cave. But hopefully, once you've seen his kind of philosophy laid out in, um, in the Gemara and Brachut, you'll read that story a little bit differently. And the way, I think the way it's easiest to read it is to say that the experiences described in the Gemara and Shabbat are what led to his philosophy maybe in the Gemara and Brachot. But there, we, don't, we don't have so many clues about like which came first, obviously. So you can try and read it in both directions. You know, it is, is the philosophy he espoused what gave rise to his ability to have the experience in the cave, or does his experience in the cave um, lead him to have the, the philosophy he espouses? Um, and then the last thing I gave for you, just uh, pages one and two of what you're gonna do um, in the kind of preparation, Chavuta, Beit Midrash time. Um, and what I gave you after that is, is this Gemara and Sukkah where, uh, where Rishon Bar Yochai sort of says, yes, um, my son and I, we are not like other people. Um, so it's something that works for him, maybe doesn't work for other people. Um, and then I gave you, for those of you who really want something extra, I gave you the Maharsha there on the Kedusha Agadot. Um, and um, he kind of does some, some work on, on the Gemara and Brachot tying it together with the Gemara and Sukkah. So those are those first two pages. It's practically impossible that anyone's gonna get through all of it in 10 minutes, but you'll get your feet wet. Maybe you'll call up a friend to have a conversation with them about it, or you'll go into one of the breakout rooms that will open momentarily to have some conversation. And then in at 9.25, we're gonna all come back together to um, do a little bit of review on these sources and then, and then tie it into a philosophy of how we might um, try and try and bring just a, a fraction of, of his of his time management philosophy into our own lives during this Shemitah year. So that's where we're headed. You might have noticed while you were learning that um, none of these texts are about Shemitah 
And you're going to say, Leia, I came to a Shemitah, the Midrash, what are we doing? This is not about Shemitah. It is, however, about allocation of time for learning Torah vis-a-vis -vis time for agriculture. And that's that's where we're starting. And, and then we're gonna we're gonna move on from there. If you peek the head, you might have noticed that uh, we move on. We're gonna move on from there together. But I, I do just want to say a few words of summary for those of you who didn't make it all the way through the, the sources that, that were on pages one and two. Um, and so there is just, just a few lines of it that I want to look at together. So the, on page one, the begin and I'll, I'll share my screen once we move on to new material, I think. Um, but page one, the, um, the, the first source that we looked at from, from Asachet Brachot, I mean, at the beginning of the bolded part. So we have Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Oh, sorry. So just to review the question that is- Rabbi Leah, if you want to share your screen, you're welcome to share the sources if you'd like to. Yeah, I'll, I'll do that in a second. But okay. um, so the, the question that's, that's under discussion is, um, you sort of have this problem, right? On the one hand, you have a verse that says, that you gather in your brain. And then on the other hand, you have this verse that says, uh, this Torah should not depart from your mouth. And the Gemara says, how are you supposed to do both of those things? And so the first suggestion is, well, you'll, uh, uh, you know, you'll, you'll set aside time for both and you'll find balance and and all of those things that, that are kind of the normal answer to that question. And then you have a Shimon Bar Yochai who says, hold up, if you plow in the plowing season and sow in the sowing season and harvest in the harvest season and thresh in the threshing season and winnow in the winnowing season, that's all the seasons. There's no time left for Torah. And he asks my favorite question <laughs> that the Bible brings up in a few different situations. He's not the only person to give voice to this question. Torah, ma teha aleha, the Torah, what is to become of her? There is no time <laughs> for Torah if you are doing all of the things that are required to do the asafa de manacha, to do the gathering in of the grain. That time doesn't exist. And then he suggests instead, Ella, Bizman she Yisrael Osin Ritzono Shal Makom, at the time when Israel is performing God's will, Melachtan Naase Al Yedai Achirin. Their work is performed by others. Time management philosophy of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Learn Torah 100% of the time and it will all work out. Now, how did Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai come to have that opinion? Well, when he had to flee from the Roman persecution and went into the cave, what did he do? He sat in the cave. Um, okay, he sat in the cave day and night and with his son and all he did was learn Torah and and Davin that's what the Gemara describes and how did they eat right that's the question how are you supposed to learn Torah and eat um, and the answer is a miracle occurred eat rachish nisa ivri lehu haruva ve'ena demaya miracle occurred a carob tree was created for them, as well as a spring of water. And apparently that is sufficient sustenance for two people for quite a long time. So I asked you to think about, you know, did the cave happen first or this espoused philosophy? Because you might think you had this experience in the cave and that's how you knew that it was possible to have and that's how we knew that this possibility of your work being done by other people was, was out there. You could say the cave happened first, or you could say only someone who has the amount of belief espoused in this philosophy, that's the only type of person who would run away with his son into a cave 
and learn Torah all the time and assume that he would possibly be able to survive. Um, so that's, uh, you could really read them in both directions. But the Gemara back in, back in the Gemara in Brachu, you see this kind of evaluative uh, conversation between Abaye and Rava. And Abaye says, you know, a lot of people have tried to do this Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai thing and it doesn't work for them. And Rava said, yeah, and when I have students, I send them home so that they to work in their fields to make sure they'll have food to eat for the year, and then they can come back and work once they know they're not going to starve. So how do you both learn Torah and not starve? That's the question, right? And Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai wants to say, just have faith. Just have faith, and you can learn Torah all the time, and it'll just work out. You'll have what to eat. So to me, that sounds like Shemitah. Shemitah is this time where you eat things that you have stored up, you eat things that are growing directly off the trees, but you don't yourself work the land. And that's where we're going, is kind of what, what is this? Oh, sorry, I meant to, I meant to mention the Gemara and Sukkah previously, right? The Gemara and Sukkah is Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai saying, I know that I'm really like me and my son are the only two people who could really pull this off. That's really the Gemara and Sukkah. So, so we have this kind of Rishimam Bar Yochai's ideal time. But what I wonder is, is that in the Shemitah year, one year out of seven, maybe we're supposed to live out that kind of dream. The dream of Rishimam Bar Yochai gets lived out by us only in the Shemitah year. So um, before we fully get to that idea, which is where we're going, now, now is when I'm going to share my screen. Hold on. Okay. Share. Let me make it bigger so that you all can see it. Here we go. All right. We're going to start out with something that's a little bit smaller than Shemitah. And what is Shemitah but a little bit smaller? Shabbos. Shabbos is the Shemitah of the week. Shemitah is the Shabbos of the years. Um, so here we go with Shabbos. So right now we're in, to go in the Yerushalmi. We have Rabbi Barachia. Rabbi Barachia, B'Shem, Rabbi Chia Barba says, Rabbi Barachia, in the, in the name of Rabbi Chia Barba says, Lo nit nu Shabbatot v'yamim tovim, Ela la'asok b'hem b'dzirei pura. Shabbat and holidays were only given, only given, so that one, could learn Torah on those days. And then the Gemara goes on to tie it into an agricultural story, which is, uh, so that's a very relatively famous line. Anyone familiar with all of the, the long conversations about how one should ideally pass their day on Shabbat? We're not gonna go into that here, but they all kind of take root in this Gemara um, with this idea that the point of Shabbos is that you are not working your field on this day and so and you're not working your job on this day and that's when you have time to learn Torah um, and the Gemara then gives this agricultural story the story of a righteous man he went out to wander in his vineyard on Shabbos Oh, and he saw uh, a hole in his fence. The Chashav Legod Roba Mote Shabbat. And he said, Oh, after Shabbos, I gotta fix my fence. I have to fence it back up after Shabbos. Amar. And he said, and then he said to himself after that, Uh oh, Hoyo the Chashafi Legodra, Amy Godura Oami. Since on Shabbat, I was thinking about my fields, about my vineyards. I'm now going to kind of like punish myself so, and I'm never going to fence it up ever. I'm never ever going to fence it up, says this chasidahad, this righteous man to himself. That he's so upset that his like agricultural worries kind of infringed on his Shabbos that he says, oh, I'm going to take it really seriously and I'm going to um, actually like Make a, make a sign for myself or something like that. Um, and I'm never going to fence up this, this broken fence that I was worried about on Shabbat. What 
did the Holy One do for him? What did God do for him? He brought, excuse me, he brought him a paper bush. And they grew up in that space that the that the brick in the fence was, and it it kind of reconstituted the fence. Um, and from this paper bush, the man was able to eat for all of his days. He was able to for it himself. And so this is that same kind of philosophy of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. When you do the right thing, you do, um, what, what's the language exactly? It's Ritzono Shal Makom, right? You do what, what um, yeah, Ritzono Shal Makom, you do what you're supposed to do and God will take care of you, right? This man took an agricultural hit by not fixing his fence. And God said, oh, I'm going to come take care of you. I'm going to have a paper bush grow up in there. You'll be able to eat from the paper bush. You'll be taken care of. So in some ways, this very same philosophy. And with the juxtaposition to the statement of Rabbi Barachia, it really seems to be, in some ways, um, a statement of what should this man have been doing instead of worrying about his field, his vineyard on Shabbos? He should have been learning Torah. And the fact that he wasn't learning Torah is what got him into this whole mess in the first place. But when he kind of repented and did his chula, God took care of him. The way says Rabbi Shifon Bar Yochai that God takes care of anyone who releases themselves from their agricultural worries and devotes themselves to Torah. Yeah, this similar idea comes up in some other places. So here we have the tour. The tour is quoting a midrash. Um, I, I myself could not find the original version of this midrash, and nobody who writes about this tour can find it either. So either the tour has a midrash that we don't have, the tour made up this midrash, lots of options. It doesn't matter because it's such a gorgeous midrash that we're just gonna go with it. Um, so the tour says, Amra Torah Lifnea Kadosh Baruch Hu, the Torah. The Torah goes to God and says, Ribono Shalala, master of the universe, when the Israelites will go into the land of Israel, this one is going to run off to his vineyard. And this one is going to run off to his field. And me, the Torah. What is going to happen to me? What's going to happen to the Torah? I hope that question sounds familiar. It's Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's question. But this time spoken in the first person by the Torah herself. What will happen to me? Amra la. God says back to the Torah. Yishli zug. I have a partner for you. Shanim is a viglach, and I'm gonna set you up with her. And what's her name? Shabbos. The Shabbat Shemel. And why is Shabbat the perfect? so gay? Oh my God! Why is Shabbos the perfect match for the Torah? Shabbos is the perfect match for the Torah because on Shabbat, they don't work. And that's when they can spend their time learning you. So Shabbos and Torah are the perfect pair. Because on Shabbos, we don't have this whole problem. How am I going to eat? No, you work the rest of your six days. So that on Shabbos, you don't have to worry about how you're going to eat. And when you don't have to worry about how you're going to eat, that's when you learn Torah. That's the Torah. And so this is part, this is the Torah's introduction to his suggestions about how much Torah a person should learn on Shabbos. So here we're going to see the Ibn Ezra now tying in Shemitah to Shabbos and to Torah learning, okay? So this is Ibn Ezra in the 20th chapter of Exodus, which is the Ten Commandments. And I'm not going to go into it. It's a very long um, Ibn Ezra, and I'm not going to really go into um, like all his whole long thing about this, but he just has this this point where he says, We've seen that the sabbatical year is similar to Shabbat. 
כי גם היא שביעית בשנה, שביעית בסבן אין ירד. וציווה השם שיקראו התורה בתחילת השנה, and God commanded that the Torah be read at the beginning of the year, this note is mine, Hakel, which is what he's talking about, is at the end of the year. So either we have a manuscript problem, like a very common manuscript problem in Ibn Ezra, or maybe there's just a mistake. I, 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 don't, I don't know exactly what to make of this, but Hakel, I can tell you, is at the end of the Shmiza year. Um, at the end of the year, Neged Anashim, the Hanashim, the Hataf, in the presence of men, women, little ones, um, and the reason for this, the Avamara Tam, Laman Yishmu, Laman Yamadu, the Shamaru, so that the reason for the Hagal and the reason for the gathering of men, women, and children is so that they can hear, they can learn, they can observe. The Hine Hashabat Natna, and Shabbos is given, Lahadin Mahase Hashem, purpose of Shabbat, says the Ezra, is to understand the works of God, Ulahagot. The Torah to, and to study God's Torah. So the Ibn Ezra in some ways is taking it one step further than the Torah, right? The Torah says, the Torah's Midrash says, they don't have to work on Shabbos. They're free on Shabbos. Now they're available to study Torah. Ibn Ezra says, Torah study is the point of Shabbos. And he's doing the opposite project that I am, right? He is learning that out from Shemitah. So he says, Shemitah comes with Hakel. Hakel is a Torah learning opportunity. Says the Ibn Ezra, therefore Shemitah is all about learning Torah, and therefore Shabbat is all about learning Torah. I'm kind of taking it in the other, in the other direction from that. But, but you, I, what you do see here is Ibn Ezra saying the point of Shabbos is Torah study, the point of Shemitah is Torah study, and Sh uh, Shemitah is like a grand version of Shabbos. It's like Shabbos with, uh, you know, blown up um, into years instead of into years. Okay. Now we're going to see just another example of someone who says, yes, Torah learning is the point of Shemitah. So now we're in the Psukim in Vayikra that discuss Shemitah. Speak to the Israelite people, say to them, When you enter the land that I assign you, the land will observe a Shabbat of Hashem, a Sabbath of the Lord. And then it goes into all these details. Six years you can sow your field, the seventh year you can prune, the six years you can prune your vineyard. And gather it in, but the seventh year you'll have a Sabbath of complete rest, a Sabbath of, again, a Sabbath of, of the Lord. Um, and right, and again, all, all of these different rules about Shemitah here, but the Sforno on this idea of Shabbat Lahashan says, Shagam Ude Adama, even the people who aren't scholars, they, have, they work the land, that's how they eat. When they rest, when they take a Shabbos during this sabbatical year, they will be awoken to seek God in some way. What is the farmer going to do during his sabbatical year when the land has to rest? The farmer will have time to be awoken. To be awoken, to seek God in some way. So I want to tie it together here and then we'll, we'll look at this fun Zohar at the end. I, I am really so far from a Zohar expert, though I was speaking to one earlier today. Um, and thank you to Professor Bill Hecker for his, um, for his, his uh, pinch hitting. Um, but I want to tie it together here and then we'll look at the Zohar and then in about in a couple of minutes we'll have an opportunity for questions that people can um, put into the chat so just if you have questions that are burning for you um, just know you'll, you'll have maybe an opportunity for them to be heard. So what where we started was Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai who says here's my ideal vision of how to live a life right how 
What is the life well lived? What is the life best lived? The life best lived is a life where you just 100% learn Torah. You don't have this issue of how am I supposed to live out the verse from Joshua, the Torah shall not depart from your mouth. You don't have a problem of, well, if the Torah is always in my mouth, how am I eating? Because, says Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, it will be taken care of for you when you are doing Ratzono Shal Makom, when you are doing God's will, it will be taken care of for you. And then we see, even within the Gemara, that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's opinion maybe worked for him and his son, but it doesn't work for other people. And Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, actually, I didn't give you the full story, but he eventually has to learn that. What I gave you is the part of the story where they come out of the cave and they see people working the land, they see people engaged in agriculture, and they they say, they emerged from the cave, they saw people who were plowing and sowing, and they said these people have abandoned the eternal life of Torah, and they engage in temporary life for their own sustenance, because they don't know that if you only engage in eternal life, you'll still be able to eat. Uh, but eventually they have to learn that not everyone is like them. So they're sent back into a cave and only allowed out once they can live in a world with people who also really need to eat. Um, but what Shemitah provides us with is the possibility maybe of like our own cave for the year. And there's no miracle in Shemitah, there's no miracle. It's not that a carob tree grows and a spring bubbles up. That's not what's gonna happen. We have to, like Shabbos, we have to prepare six years in order to have enough food to eat during our Shemitah. But then, in our Shemitah year, that's the year that we can be Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. And that's the year where all of our food needs are taken care of. And we can actually just spend time learning Torah. And what I want to say is that because those of us in North America are not farmers, in Israel who are maybe ceasing into, or, or in an idealized biblical Israel who are ceasing to work the land during this year and are totally free to learn Torah, maybe what we can do is use this year to invest in our weekly miniature Shemitah and use this year to invest in our weekly Shemitah of the week, i.e. Shabbat, and to really invest in our Torah learning on Shabbos and spend Shabbos as Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai would want us to spend every day of every year and say, during this Shemitah year, I'm gonna learn an extra hour, an extra 15 minutes of Torah every Shabbos because Shemitah is about digging out that time from my need to work and support my family and be and eat. <laughs> um, it's about finding that moment of security and saying, in that free moment of security, I'm going to learn Torah. And I think we can all do that in some way. And you're also welcome to do that during the week, all year round, whenever is the right time for you. But I think everyone could probably find a few more minutes for learning on Shabbos. And that's what I want to recommend as a Shemitah practice that we can all take home with us during, during this Shemitah year. Um, and the last thing I wanted, I do want to leave you with in just the last minute, it's obviously so much richer than I have the capability of explaining or uh, we have the capability of spending time on, but the Zohar has this idea of people who aren't living in Eretz Yisrael observing Shemitah in just this way. So the Zohar says, Ta chaze, come and see the whole Shemitah of Shemitah and every Shemitah year, Kruza Nafik, a proclamation goes out and men and women get together, and all the Daniel Matt translated this as scions of faith, um, usliku, and they um and, and they go and they they kind of take off their earthly wrappings and they, they go up and they learn uh, and they experience they, they go up to sorry, they go up to the heavenly academy. Um, um, 
and they experience there this tremendous joy um, and just joy upon joy. And then what happens? The youth, that's um, in the Zohar, the youth is Metatron, who's like the chief angel. Um, Metatron, who's hit, holding the, the keys of, of God, he gets up and he tells them various new and ancient words of Torah, right? Everyone, men, women, all people of faith go up into the heavenly academy in the Shemitah year and they sit in the yeshiva shalmala and they learn Torah and they see chedva, delit chedva, kahahi chedva, joy unmatched by any other. So I'm going to take questions now, but I want to wish you in your extra Shemitah Torah learning time when you're tapping into your inner Rabbi Shimon Baruchai that I want to wish you joy unmatched by any other joy in that special Shemitah learning that I hope you all embark in. Okay, so I think the way we are going to do, um, I think the way we're going to do questions is if people put them into the chat. While people, While people are, are typing, there. I'll ask a question that's come up for me. Thinking about, uh, you mentioned the Hakel uh, comes up here, uh, the midst of everyone gathering together and recreating Mount Sinai at the end of the Shemitah year. There's another mitzvah that comes at the very end of the Torah, which we were reading very recently, which is a more private mitzvah, the mitzvah of writing a Sefer Torah. And I'm wondering about the public-private aspect of maybe of Shemitah, of Bar Yochai, who's so much in the cave on his own, hey, with his son, but they, they can't emerge, right? And, and yet there's a struggle of, they have to influence the world. That's like, they've been inside for so long. And so I, I'm wondering what that, what that says to you. Mm, interesting. So the balance between private and public learning and public influence. And obviously, right, that, that the Hakal learning versus the, the private writing of a Sefer Torah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I wonder whether, you know, so, so we talked about this a little bit because that there's something confusing about the Ibn Ezra where he says Hakal happens at the beginning of Shemitah. But I actually wonder if we go back to his idea, but, but with Hakal at the end, uh, which is when it is, then that then maybe there's a process there of like, you do your Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, everyone on their own, learning their own Torah in their own caves. And then at the end of the year, we like get together for Siyam Hashas or whatever, right? Like then we get this massive gathering that's sort of like a celebration and, and of everyone's learning and a reinvigoration also of, okay, you know, like this happens Whenever people spent like that, this is like the classic thing people say about 18 year olds who go to Israel for the year and they study all the time. And then when they leave, there has to actually be like a process of like, how are you going to learn Torah when you're in college? And I wonder whether Hakel is maybe in a way like that process that like the Hakel is the, the moment of like uh, encouragement and, and invigoration before you go back to your job um, and go back to these much more times where it's much more difficult to just like learn Torah because you have to eat and put food on the table. Um, so maybe maybe that's the balance that one kind of promotes the other. Dr. Michelle Friedman just put something into the chat if you're reading it. I think that's a great question for us to end with tonight. Okay, so Dr. Friedman says, I appreciate what you just taught us, the priority of learning in the Shemitah year. Do you see sources that honor the land? Humankind's need to step back from managing natural resources our need to let the land rest has a lot of implications for the climate movement. Oh, absolutely. And, and also I do wanna say, there is so much to learn about Shemitah. That's not what I taught tonight. Um, Come back for more sessions. <laughs> yeah, um, and even, even I, 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 maybe this is, I'm not allowed to say this, but there might even be more to learn about Shemitah than what will be learned in all of these sessions combined, you know? Um, but I, certainly there is so much of importance about the climate movement. Um, and, but I do think one of, one of the ways I wanna tie in what I'm saying to the climate movement is that sometimes we see um, retraction 
as only um, a loss. Like we only experience it as a loss. Oh, once upon a time I used disposable plates and it was so easy, but now I don't use them anymore because I know that it's bad for the planet. So now I spend my whole Shabbos doing dishes or whatever, right? And we experience it as like a sadness. But um, I wonder whether what Shemitah can offer or what, what this vision I put forward of Shemitah tonight can offer us by way of metaphor is that sometimes when you retract from something, it opens up opportunities for something that's bigger, that's better, that's more valuable. So just to go back to my silly plates example, um, all of a sudden you're using your nice plates on Shabbos because you're not using disposable anymore. And now you're honoring Shabbos in a more serious way because you're using fancier or setting your table more fancy. And so I, I do think like this idea that like, well, you stop that thing that's kind of the bread and butter and normal of your life for an important reason, whether that's God's command or God's command vis-a-vis -vis protecting the planet. Um, and, and it's not just loss, it's also opportunity. And what we fill that opportunity with um, is, is really important. Um, and, and honestly, one of the most pressing questions of our, of our time, kind of politically and globally um, as well. This is amazing. There are a number of other wonderful questions that have been placed into the chat in just the last moment. And I'm, I'm really sorry that we're, we're just about out of time. Uh, so we'll hopefully circle back to some of these in the future. And if you have the opportunity to interact with Rabbi Nitzarna in the future, feel free to ask her directly uh, as well. One thing that did come up earlier that I'll point out in the minute or so that we've got until we have to close up is a, um, a, a point that someone made about how Shabbat for many people feels like an opportunity primarily of prayer. We go to shul and we daven. Beit Tzfilah, Beit Knesset becomes a place of prayer. Uh, and yet so much of what we do in shul is really the shul as Beit Midrash, shul as place of study. Uh, and so there can be sort of those two sides in one's Shabbat experience. And I'll argue as well in one's Shemitah experience, while so much of Shemitah is about studying and experiencing God's Torah, there is space there as well for us to work on that other Shabbat aspect on our tefillah uh, as well, just something that came up earlier that I thought was interesting that someone uh, started to point out to us. Um, and our time, uh, like Shemitah, is, is confined, uh, is just about up right now. Even as Shemitah begins, our time tonight is just about up. Um, Rabbi Nitsarna, I really want to start off by thanking you. A number of people have already said thank you to you in the chat, and I'll invite people to continue to do so right now. Um, I want to thank our interpreters tonight, uh, both Rivka and Molly, for helping us out to follow along. Um, I see her on my screen right now, so I'll thank Matisse, uh, and along with Mark Aronson, uh, for facilitating and sponsoring our efforts to bring um, ASL and closed captioning to the larger community. Thank you for inspiring us. And uh, Matisse, I'll say this personally, for your wisdom, uh, for your back and forth texts as we work to perfect the system, and we will continue to do so. Um, I want to thank each and every one of our partner schools uh, and institutions for joining us uh, and for publicizing this program. Uh, each, of one, uh, each and every one of you for being with us tonight. Uh, and please, God, to join us again. Uh, we invite you on November 7th, as we hear from Rabbi Chaim Schaffner of Congregation Kesher Israel in Washington, D.C. Uh, his topic is Like Dreamers, 19th Century Zionists and Their Views of Shemitah. So an exciting and fascinating topic as well. And we'll continue from there for another four sessions beyond that as well. And finally, I'll thank YCT Rabbinical School uh, for bringing us together tonight, for allowing this to happen, uh, and for really, really bringing together an amazingly robust group of partners and learners, thinking about Shemitah, feeling this exciting opportunity to join together as a community around North America learning together. We look forward to seeing you again in a few weeks. Stay tuned for an email coming up soon with some more coming attractions. In the meantime, I wish us all a wonderful night. Laila Tov, and uh, coming up on Cheshvan Kodesh Tov as well. Have a good night.